Welcome back to part two of the SIBO Doctor podcast, and let's jump right back into it. Now, moving on, I want to get into the, the immunotherapy, but before we go there, can we talk a bit about this concept of la- a loss of immune tolerance and yeast hypersensitivity? And somewhere uh, I was reading about your, your thoughts on that die-off may not be problem with detoxification, but really more the yeast sensitivity that people have developed. Um, and that when you're killing it, you're exposing the immune system to more um, yeast substances, and it's more of a reaction from the immune system, which I find really uh, very astute and very interesting. Yeah. So the the book you mentioned, um, Nerala, the, the missing diagnosis that Dr. Trust wrote many years ago. So he was an allergist. And so that was my first tip off that there was sort of an allergic hypersensitivity component because he wrote about how he was treating patients with different dilutions of um, candida extract as part of their, like a key part of their therapy. And then Dr. Sidney Baker, who's one of the the founding fathers of of functional medicine, he also writes about in his books, uh, I think one of them is detoxification and healing, um, the components of how he would treat this problem, you know, with diet, some sort of antifungal therapy, and sometimes this immunotherapy. And so, um, The way I talk about it with patients is that you can have an overgrowth of yeast um, that's easier to treat, or you could have what uh, hypersensitivity that's developed just from, you know, genetically different people are predisposed to developing allergies. And if that's part of your genetic makeup and your body gets an overgrowth of yeast, you can develop an allergy to the point that, you know, you're reacting um, an allergic hypersensitivity type of way to the normal yeast that lives on your mucous membranes. And, um, the typical things we see with that is I always tell patients we're going to treat the overgrowth first because there, there's definitely some people where we just have to treat an overgrowth and they don't have a hypersensitivity. And then it's usually easier to, to treat those people. But if we keep treating them and it keeps coming back, particularly if it comes back within a couple of days, uh, we know that yeast doesn't grow that quickly. So it's probably then this hypersensitivity that's developed where the body can no longer tolerate the normal amounts that that live in our GI tract, the same as our body can no longer tolerate like the pollen in the air or the mold or the dust at at normal allergic sort of phenomenon. Uh, And we know that there is data on patients who develop this allergic hypersensitivity. It uh, in some ways compromises the immune system's ability to keep that organism in check. And, you know, when we have allergy on our mucous membranes, there's more inflammation, there's inhibition of normal immune responses. And so it's more likely to kind of have overgrowth of different organisms if you have allergic responses on your mucous membranes. So um, those are the some of the things with the hypersensitivity immune tolerance issue. Um, and we can talk more about kind of how to address that. For some patients, if we just treat the problem long enough, their body gets used to more of a normal microbiome and microbiome. And it just self resolves. It it just self self resolves as we treat them. For other people, some of the things we use for patients with uh, histamine intolerance and MCAS type issues that can be helpful if we think it's more of an allergic hypersensitivity response. As part of treating the overgrowth, we can also use antihistamines, uh, natural or pharmaceutical um, mast cell stabilizing medications. So those things can be helpful. And then there's ways to retrain the immune system more directly. And the couple of ways that I offer to patients, one is a referral to an allergist who would actually test them for molds and pollens and all of those things and consider allergy shots as one way to retrain the immune system. As far as what we directly, you know, as integrative and naturopathic practitioners can offer, there's this whole system of therapy that Dr. Ty Vincent uh, came up with called low-dose immunotherapy. And his website for anyone that wants to learn more is globalimmunotherapy.com, I believe. And it's based on homeopathy for naturopathic doctors who are trained in that or other doctors that are trained in that. Um, It works very different from homeopathy, but it's, I think of it sort of as a variation of, and it's a way where we can, um, there's dilutions of the antigen that we're working on, whether that's environmental allergens, food allergens, or yeast in this case that have been diluted, usually past Avogadro's number. So it is a homeopathic in that range. Uh, and that's usually the range that helps people. It's a dose that's given, you know, every so often to help retrain the immune system just as a couple of drops under the tongue uh, as a way that he describes as reestablishing immune tolerance to that organism. I think that's that's going to be a really good resource for people to look that up. I wonder if 
because uh, I've, I've, you know, I deal a lot with people with leaky gut, and we know that candida can, in the hyphal stage, can burrow into the mucosa and cause um, intestinal hyperpermeability, and obviously that is one of the foundations as to how the immune system would lose tolerance to that organism. And I wonder if it's the similar mechanism as to why some people can't tolerate probiotics, because when you have leaky gut and you, you're exposing your, your body to um, probiotics and you can actually launch an immune response to uh, particular probiotics. I have lots of people who say every time they, I take any probiotics, there's a problem. So, um, and then using these types of immune therapies in conjunction with a uh, with healing leaky gut, I I assume, is uh, uh, going to be more successful. That's an interesting concept because I haven't really dealt with. I sometimes use desensitization drops, but to be honest, I haven't found them to be useful. So I'm really interested in looking into this particular program that you mentioned. Um, but just to reiterate for people who may have missed it, because we're just moving at lightning speed here, Ami. So, <laughs> you know, we've got a lot to cover because we're experts in this. So we're just like, uh, it's just really, it's really cool. Um, so my thought is also on, um, well, like that's what I was going to say to people. If you missed it, that the die off, if you have really severe die off, that may not be because you can't detoxify it. This is what... Um, was just mentioned is that this may be more that you're actually have an allergy to the uh, dying or, or the, the, the endotoxins of uh, yeasts that are being spilled rather than, because uh, uh, this is what I hear a lot. A lot of people are, you know, just pushing on with detoxification and it's not working. So, so that's a really good pointer there. Now let's sort of move on to, uh, the uh this issue of biofilm because candida is a fairly strong biofilm uh former and i just actually got this email from dr rabar and he's he's been using uh diatomaceous earth and i wondered if you've been if you have any experience with that and i've just been experimenting with it and uh, the jury's out but it's it's you know, well tolerated by most and um, seems to be an inexpensive way to perhaps deal with candida specifically with biofilm. Right. So yeah, biofilms are interesting. I, you know, I shied away from using them. I'm using them, uh, biofilm treatments I'm using a lot more now. I, I would say, I don't think it's necessarily an essential part of the initial program of addressing a yeast problem. Um, because there's patients that respond when we just treat them with herbals. But I think herbs are also so diverse. I know Stephen Buhner in a lot of his books on Lyme and co-infections talks about how a lot of herbs have biofilm properties. So it could be that we were treating it without even knowing it. And that's why some people would get better without specifically addressing it. Um, that being said, I think it's definitely worth considering in patients who have complex issues, especially if it's coming back a lot, it could be that the immune system isn't seeing the organisms. Um, my caution with that was always that biofilms, you know, there's healthy biofilms as well. And when we use too aggressive of protocols, we are disrupting the healthy and the um, not so helpful biofilms. And so um, I, I learned about a lot about biofilm treatment from some of Dr. Anderson's, Paul Anderson's lectures. And I really like one of his products, the biofilm phase two. Um, I haven't used the one you mentioned, Nerala, but I've been using a lot more of the biofilm phase two. And I have found it helpful. Um, for some chronically ill patients, it can cause biofilm treatment can cause an exacerbation of symptoms because the immune system is finally seeing things that it previously couldn't see. So we just have to be ready for that. And so I let all of our patients know that if that happens, we back off, we add adrenal support, maybe add more antimicrobials and different things that Dr. Anderson talks about. And usually that can get them through it. But it's also a good sign that we're getting to the organisms finally that we sort of have been trying to treat for a while that the immune system just really couldn't um, get to. So I, I think it's helpful, although I'm not convinced it's always required if you're, especially if you're using herbal protocols that might cover it in other ways. So speaking of uh, herbal 
treatments or or just yeast treatments and you don't have to go into super great detail because I think you've got a course coming out and we will promote that course when when the time comes uh but in general you know you you do you have um a few favorites that you routinely use Yes, you know, I there's an old product from Thorn Research SF722 that I find helpful. Um, one of it's undiaslinic acid, so that that one's really good. Um, it's all about finding the right uh, herbal product for whatever type of yeast strain that patient has. So I always explain that if we try something and it doesn't work, it doesn't mean that this isn't part of their problem. It might be that we didn't find the right agent, just like with you know, bacteria and antibiotics, not every bacteria is going to be susceptible to a particular antibiotic. Um, The other herbs, I use a lot of products from a company called Supreme Nutrition that one of my mentors formulated. I'm not affiliated with them, but they're really high quality, um, you know, no additive type products. And they have a lot of the herbs that we use for SIBO and SIFO that overlap that have some form of berberine or neem or other things in them that I find very helpful as well. So Those are a couple of the products that I routinely use. Um, And the nice part is I, you know, I consider them broad spectrum antimicrobial herbs, especially the Supreme Nutrition products. So we're often covering for multiple organisms, not just yeast as we're treating them. And and Nystatin, you use that as well and sort of the standard antifungals. Um, And what's the length? Because I find that yeast treatment is typically a quite a prolonged uh, process because I always tell people, look, your digestive tract, uh, if I were to take it out, it's got the surface area of a, a, more than a tennis court. So you're not going to just get there in two weeks time to really ferret out all these different nooks and crannies of, um, you know, yeast overgrowth. Right. So usually in my experience, it's been more months rather than weeks. Right. So I, I do at least a trial of one to three months. Um, to see how they did. And if they're not having any response, we'll often switch up the therapy. I do use Nystatin. I, you know, my bias is I don't love to use any pharmaceuticals long-term, but it is quite safe. So I do use it if it's helping someone. And if it's just kind of going on and on, that's when I think about, you know, do we need to address biofilms? Is there a hypersensitivity response that keeps coming, that this keeps coming back? Is there a mold exposure? Um, Systemic antifungals, I usually only do for a couple of weeks because they have a lot of drug interactions And I just don't love the idea of using them longer term, but I feel comfortable using Nystatin in the months range. Um, And then we could always switch it up to herbal therapies if they're open to that, just because it is for some people more of an ongoing treatment that we have to do for a while while we work on all the other aspects of things. I think I used to use a lot more um, of that Thorn product you mentioned, but it's just the dose is just so crazy high. You got to take like 15 pills, you know, so so that's a, a little bit of a turnoff for some people. Yes. But um, all right. Well, excellent. Thank you so much for all of that insight. Um, just kind of finishing up on this issue of, and I talk a lot about histamine intolerance on my podcast, especially when it comes to candida, because it's just, I find that goes hand in hand so often. Um, What are your thoughts on that? And how do you differentiate uh, in your patients in terms of, you know, MCAS is thrown around a lot right now. It's like everybody that has histamine intolerance is told they have MCAS, but how do you approach that? Right. So we know from Dr. Theo Hermides' work, who's one of the, the teachers on this topic, that uh, fungi do cause mast cells to degranulate. So it makes sense that if someone had an overgrowth, they would have a histamine issue as well. I don't do the lab testing for MCAS and histamine intolerance. Um, it's just kind of challenging to do. It requires a lot of special lab parameters. So I'm typically not telling someone they have MCAS unless they've come to me with that diagnosis. I more just use broad terms like histamine intolerance. And, you know, I try to explain that the histamine hypersensitive, the histamine excess is usually some combination of allergic phenomenon and dysbiosis. And so I see a lot of people with protozoa that that's causing uh, excess histamine issues, um, a lot of skin issues, like you said, with, with fungal overgrowth, um, other forms of dysbiosis. And then some people are just prone to allergies. Again, genetically, some of us just have more allergic predisposition. So I think some way of treating the allergies, whether it's the low-dose immunotherapy or antihistamines or allergy shots or whatever it is, can help decrease that overall load of the whole histamine reactivity. Um, Dr. Galland, another one of the founders of functional medicine, he's talked about a theory 
where he he said the Karolinska Institute did a study showing a link between excess mast cell degranulation histamine issues in a certain percent of the population with EMF exposure. So that was one of his theories where that might be contributing to the current phenomenon of excess histamine problems. And so we do, I do have some handouts on my website for EMF sensitivity, just basic things like turn the Wi-Fi off at night, put it on a timer, hardwire your ethernet, you know, things like that, that can be helpful as a piece of the puzzle as we treat all of the other GI symptoms that that might be causing that the hypersensitivity issues. Yeah, I've heard that theory um, before from Dr. Dietrich Kling, uh, Klinghart, I think, who who postulated that that maybe one of the reasons we're seeing such virulence in not just fungi, fungi but also a host of other organisms is because um, of the we're much more exposed to to Wi-Fi and other frequencies. You know, it's a really interesting uh, concept that makes sense if if you know, if there's such a study that we could do, that would be wonderful. Um, our, well, thank you so much, Ami, for your time and for your uh, amazing uh, presence in in this field and your insights. Now, where can people find out more about you and do you take on patients? I know you work with Dr. Gurevich, who I've interviewed many times and has done some courses for us. So it's great. Yeah. So my practice is in Portland, Oregon and the licensing laws for MDs at this time, I mostly see patients in Oregon and Washington where I'm licensed. So I cannot do virtual visits at this time. Um, but I just recommended if patients are interested at some point, I think those laws are, are rapidly changing. So I have a newsletter sign up. I won't send you anything. I'm literally just, I'll be in touch if at some point I can see patients out of my licensed states. Um, and then, uh, Narella, like we talked about, we'll be in touch with your audience once we have the course ready for them for a physician course on these topics that we're updating at this time. And my, oh, and my website is just amikapadia.com. So it's just my name.com. I have a resource tab that has lots of different handouts, basically just for patient education, it might be helpful for practitioners at, as well for some of the topics that we went over. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time and um, all the best in the, in the new year. Yes, you too, Nurla. Thank you for your time today. It was good talking to you. Thank you for listening to the SIBO Doctor Podcast. We hope you find the information in this episode useful in the treatment of your SIBO patients. Thanks to our sponsors, SIBOtest.com, a breath testing service with easy online ordering. Thanks again for listening.